Hi, all. Welcome back for our next session of our third day of the FreeBSD Developer Summit. Um, one thing I'd encourage you during breaks and so forth, if you're not stretching your legs or doing something like that, you can feel free to go hang out in the hallway track. We were talking a little bit, um, just various thoughts and chit chat. So it's a great place to just go do a little bit of the social part of being at our conference. Uh, but our next talk is going to be from Matt Ahrens talking about Razy expansion. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Awesome, thanks. Um, let me get my screen sharing. Let's do that. Screen sharing is coming. All right. Are you, hopefully, you're seeing my slides now. Cool. So uh, I'm at Aaron's. I'm here to talk to you about uh, ZFS RAID Z expansion. Um, I work for Delphix, and this work is sponsored by the FreeBC Foundation. I'm actually seeing your whole desktop. Oh, all right. Then let me um, make sure that we're getting the right thing here. There we go. Better? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So have you ever used ZFS? and been staring down a problem like this. You're using uh, RAID Z2 or, or some sort of RAID Z and uh, you're at basically full capacity, 95%. You have no free space and uh, you're sitting with a uh, drive that you'd like to add to it. You have additional storage, but it's just not in this pool um, and there's nothing you can do about it because you have to add disks to RAID Z in whole VDEV groups. So you're, you're sitting here thinking, ah, I, like, I have five disks. I wish I could add the sixth disk that I have. I don't have room or money for five new disks to make it 10. Um, what do I do? So to put it another way, you have a RAID Z pool with five disks in it. You want to add a sixth, di a sixth disk, expanding the pool's capacity. That's what this project does. So the solution uh, you can run now, well, once, once my code integrates, uh, you can run Z pool attach. Um, to add this new disk. So you, the way that you type it in is the pool attached. The name of the pool here is test. The uh, VDEV that you're attaching to is RAID Z2-0. So RAID Z2 is the type and zero is the ID, which you can get from the Z pool status output down here. And then the new disk that I'm adding in this example is var temp six. You can imagine it's like dev disk, uh, whatever. So you run that. Um, it does not complete instantaneously. Uh, so uh, there's some work that we need to do in the background. Um, and uh, so the, the command returns and then you can observe the background progress with uh, Z pool status. So it's gonna tell you here, um, you know, RAID Z expand is in progress. Uh, this is how much we've copied, 4,444 megabytes in this example, and the total amount of the rate and uh, estimated time of completion. And you can see that the new disk six here is part of the pool. Um, but the, uh, while this is in progress, your space available is still the same. So we have to wait for the uh, expansion to complete uh, before we actually can use the additional space. To do that waiting, uh, you can use the Z full wait subcommand. After the uh, expansion completes, the Z full status will reflect that. So now it says expansion completed. Um, the disk is part of the configuration. And now we have more space available. So in this case, we went from almost nothing to 600 megs. Um, and our capacity is now 77% instead of 95%. We have a bunch of free space. The size is larger. Um, so this is a good point to remind uh, folks uh, or inform folks that, that don't already know this, that um, the way that space usage is reported in ZFS, there's kind of two different ways to think of it. One is what space is allocated and what space is free. And this is reported in zpool list. So this is really talking about like the low level uh, details of the, of the space allocator. Um, and uh, unfortunately this is featured somewhat prominently, you know, if you're using the zpool command, but usually, you know, you really wanna be looking at the available slash used, which is reported in ZFS list. This is talking about like how much logical space do we think you can actually write uh, before running out of space. So this is, it's kind of a guess um, because, you know, it might depend on a bunch of things, you know, compression, for example, um, and also the amount of parity used by RAID Z. So 
In particular with RAID Z, the parity, the space that's used for parity is part of the allocation. So the space that's used by the parity is included in the size and alloc and free here. But um, in ZFS list, uh, it is kind of ignored um, or abstracted away. So uh, the space available here is 600 megs. We, I think we added a uh, one gigabyte device in this kind of trivial example. And 600 megs uh, more like usable space is available now. All right. So um, hopefully that was like uh, exciting that it can happen, but also boring that like there's, there, you know, you just type it and it does it and then you're done. Um, so uh, I thought that folks would be interested in how does this actually work? Um, and so we'll talk about, I'm gonna talk the rest of the talk about kind of how this works and what the design implications are of, um, of those design decisions. So first off, um, we talked, uh, you saw that like, it doesn't complete instantaneously. Um, it has to do some work. What is, what is it doing? Uh, so we, we're changing the whole on-disk state. Uh, what does this on-disk state look like after the expansion completes? Um, so first let's take a, uh, a rewind a bit to how does traditional RAID do it? Um, so with traditional like RAID four, five, six, the parity is at fixed locations. So in this example, I'm showing like RAID four where the parity is all on one disk. Um, and I'm using in these diagrams, you'll see throughout the talk, the color indicates the parity group. So like this uh, orange P four through six is the parity of uh, sectors four, five, and six. Um, and uh, that's at a fixed location. So like if you change the data at, uh, at sector five, then we have to re raid, Z, raid four has to recalculate it to, has to recalculate the parity there. Um, traditional RAID expansion, it does it by basically like reflowing the data, uh, but not reflowing the parity. So uh, you can see here, like this orange row, before it had the parity was of four, five, six, but we've reflowed the data. So now the parity would have to be the parity of five, six, seven, eight. Um, but you know, this, this would work fine for traditional RAID. Uh, you have like, you know, you're, you're, you're getting the, the RAID five right hole, uh, you know, every, uh, all over the place because um, while you're in the middle of this, you know you have to recalculate all these parodies. You know, I hope you don't crash during the middle of it. <laughs> uh, RAID Z does not work that way. It, it, fall, it has the same kind of idea of reflow, where like we're taking the sectors and we're kind of like renumbering them and moving them, moving them from the old to the new locations. But with RAID Z, the parity is like part of the allocation. Um, and when we are doing the reflow, we're, we are reflowing both data and parity. Um, so in this example, if you look at say this yellow um, row, uh, five is the parity of six, seven, eight. Um, after we reflow it, uh, we're moving all of those sectors, both data and parity. So five comes over here and five is still the parity of six, seven, and eight. So we're not changing what the parity is calculated of, um, which uh, has a bunch of benefits, uh, and at least of which, um, you know, if you crash in the middle of this, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward to know where you are. We can atomically move it forward. Um, I see some questions, which I will get to when, um, when we get a break, or perhaps I will answer them. Uh, perhaps the rest of my talk will answer them. We'll see. Um, So uh, another cool thing about RAID Z expansion is that the reflow doesn't care where the parity is. So in this example, I, sh I showed that the parity all being on the first disk, but that's kind of like a contrived example. And that's not how it actually occurs with you know, any real world layout. So you might have um, some smaller non-full stripe, uh, non-full width uh, parity groups. So you know, five here is the parity of six uh, in practice, you know, that's just kind of like a mirror. Um, but in, in wider examples, you'd have all, all kinds of different sizes. Um, so in this case, uh, the reflow, like we're, we're, the numbers here are all exactly the same as they were on the previous slide. One, two, three, four, five in the first row, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the second row. It's just that which ones happen to be parity and which ones happen to be data uh, are different, but RAID's expansion doesn't need to know about that or care about that. Um, but uh, we can, um, and uh, 
it would be kind of hard to, to figure it out. If we needed to, we could find that information by going and traversing all of the block pointers in the pool, uh, but that would be pretty expensive. So, uh, but we can find what space is allocated and what space is free uh, really efficiently uh, from the space maps. So we only have to copy the actual data that was allocated. In this, in this example, I'm showing like 11 through 16 were not allocated. We don't have to copy them. We only have to copy the stuff that was allocated. So the cool thing about this is that, um, well, it works. And we don't have to change or read the, or even read the block pointers. Um, the reads and writes happen sequentially. So you know, in theory, they can go very fast. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, we don't need to know where the parity is. Uh, and um, the segments are still on different disks. So redundancy is preserved. I'll get to that, uh, some examples of that in, in a minute. Cool. So um, after the expansion completes, then um, new writes can use the new stripe width. So in this case, uh, you know, we have 11 through 16 were not used. We didn't copy them. But then if we do a new write, we can allocate um, that whole 11 through 16, and we can have a new better data to parity ratio of, um, you know, in this case, four data sectors with one parity sector. Um, this has some implications, <laughs> um, I, which come back to the difference between like used and allocated. Um, so the, the DMU's view of uh, what space is like logically used versus like what the allocator has allocated. Um, so uh, to make that with RAID Z, you, know, you always have this kind of ratio uh, of like you're using some of the allocated space as parity, but we don't want that to show up in the use slash avail. So the way that that works in ZFS is there's like this presumed data to parity ratio, um, which is calculated when you first uh, create the pool or create the VDIV, I should say. Um, and so uh, after the expansion, we're, we don't need to allocate quite as much parity for, for each piece of data on average. So you might find that the space used uh, is actually a little bit lower than you expected due to the improved data to parity ratio. Uh, oh, and um, because now we have blocks with different um, logical stripe widths, we need to know, uh, we need to be able to figure out like which logical stripe width it was. And we can do that by using the blocks birth time, which is in the block pointer um, to determine like if it was written before slash during the expansion or, or written after the expansion with the new um, larger logical stripe width. Cool, so uh, that's a little bit of how it works. Um, we talked about like the end state that we wanna be in. Uh, unfortunately, we can't just like stop all access to the pool, read the whole pool into memory, you know, re-jigger uh, everything and then spot it all back out atomically. Um, that would be really nice uh, if we could. It, it would have made my life a lot easier, but unfortunately you probably don't have that much RAM. Um, we wanna, and so we wanna be able to do this incrementally as we're processing the normal flow of reads and writes. Uh, so here, this is just a, uh, the same thing that we saw before, uh, a little bit bigger. Um, again, the colors indicating the uh, logical straight widths, which will come into play a little bit later. Um, so this is the desired end state. On the left is the beginning, uh, is what we start with. We wanna have this end state on the right. How do we get from there here to there? So we start off by adding the new disk and it's just empty and everything is where it was before. And so um, we want to re reflow it by, you know, reading. So like we have to read logical sector number five and then write it over here, read sector six and then write it over here, et cetera, et cetera. Here's, so we're, we're doing this kind of in order. Uh, we get some possible intermediate, intermediary state here where we've copied um, up to sector 30 to the new location. And while we're in the middle of this, we want to preserve all of RAID Z's um, redundancy guarantees. So, you know, in this example, we're talking about RAID Z1, which means that you should be able to lose any one disk without losing any data. Um, so let's think about what happens if we lose this um, fourth disk. We're going to lose all that data. But um, if we, so if we think about this green stripe here, um, you know, it's going to have one piece of parity and three pieces of data, 
uh, and we can lose any one of them and be able to reconstruct it. But if we lose two of them, then uh, we cannot reconstruct it. And we've lost that data. So uh, from what we see here, we've lost two pieces of that green stripe and um, we're, we're out of luck. That would not be good. So how do we deal with this? Um, the way that we deal with this is that we, um, we all, when we're doing a read of a split stripe, a stripe where part of it is in the new location and part of it is in the old location, uh, we actually read the entire stripe from the old location. So, uh, you know, 29, 29, 30, 30, these, these should have the same exact contents, but it's still here in the old location. So uh, we can read from this, this version of 29 and 30. Um, and that way we have lost only one sector of this, uh, of this stripe. You know, this, uh, by stripe, I'm talking about like the, the parity and data that's associated with it. Um, the trick here is that we need to maintain enough separation between the old locations and the new locations so that we aren't like, we haven't, uh, 29 is still here. We haven't overwritten it yet. Um, so how do we do that? <laughs> Um, once you get far enough along, it's easy. Like you, you know, like if you're a gigabyte in, you know, the separation between the the new locations, the old locations, is really big, and so it's easy to avoid that. Um, and we can like issue lots of uh, concurrent reads and writes, and everything is fine because we can mess with that intermediate region um, to our heart's content until we uh, sync out the progress uh, as part of the TXG. But what about at the very beginning? So at the very beginning, like you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll show you more later. At the very beginning, we're stuck with copying one sector at a time, right? Like we have to take five from here and put it here. We can't take six and put it in its new location like at the same time because five is still there. We still got to read that. And we would end up with not enough separation to guarantee that the each stripe it, uh, can be read from its old location. So um, the, the trick here is, uh, we, we do that, you remember when I said it would be nice if we could just like atomically slurp everything into memory and then splat it back out again. Uh, that's what we do for the very beginning of the, um, uh, at the very beginning of the expansion. So uh, we read in the first, uh, basically like the width squared number of sectors. So like each, each disc we read in like number of disks sectors at least uh, and, and um, into memory and then Spot it back out again, all all as one chunk, um, and uh, so we have enough memory to do that, which is great because because it's just a little bit of of space. Um, but uh, if you if you die in the in the middle of it, like if the system crashes and some of those writes have ta have been persisted and some haven't, then you'd end up with like the beginning of the disks scrambled up. Um, so we take advantage of this bootloader region, which was previously unused. It's at kind of at the beginning of each disk before. The, um, the allocatable space that I'm depicting here. Um, so we can stick it all there, uh, wait for that to be persisted, then write it to the like real allocatable space region here. Um, and if you crash in the middle, then uh, we can get the data from the bootloader region. It was not actually used for the bootloader, that's just what it was called. Cool, so here's... Uh, <clears throat> Walking through an example of like, we've done that initial um, uh, five squared uh, amount of rewrites, and now we have a separation of six, which means that we can copy one at a time because it's one more than the width. So uh, twenty-one is not used. We need the previous. We need the next ones in case uh, we have a failure, and so we're copying one sector at a time. We get to the end of that first row, and now we have two. Um, sectors in a row that we don't need, so we can copy two at a time, um, and so on and so forth. Each row letting us do one more sector at a time. Um, in reality, the um, bootloader region is large enough that you're gonna be copying like a whole bunch, and so the initial separation is much more than just um, six, you know, it's, it's, a, it's big. And so uh, that improves efficiency a little bit at the, um, at the beginning. So um, design implications. This works with, um, you know, I, I showed the example of RAID-Z1 um, and RAID-Z2 works with all the RAID-Z1, 2, and 3. You can expand, you can add disks one at a time, uh, multiple times. So you can go from uh, like four wide to five wide, five wide to six wide. 
Um, we talked about the data to parity ratio. You know, this means that um, you know when you go uh, say from four wide to five wide, you'll use about 20% less space for new writes. Um, and uh, we preserve the uh, RAID-Z's redundancy guarantees, um, but the RAID-Z has to be healthy during, like while we're actually copying blocks. So um, if, if we have the disk failure, like we saw in the example, um, RAID-Z is basically gonna, like the expansion is going to pause and wait for the uh, that missing device to be reconstructed. Um, it automatically detects that, you know, based on the IO failures, and uh, that's that's quite tricky to do because we have a bunch of um, reads and writes in flight, uh, and we have to realize, like, oh, you know, we have to figure out how far we actually got stuff persisted, um, and then redo those, uh, reissue, you know, some of those in thing, some of those IOs that might have been in flight to the missing disk um, when it comes back and is re uh, has been reconstructed. Cool. So um, performance, how does it perform? Um, uh, all right, so in this example, uh, we're looking at like logical megabytes per second. So in other words, like the application is writing to a file uh, or a bunch of files, how many megabytes per second can it get? So in this example, uh, before expansion, uh, we're getting 1800 megabytes per second and uh, writes and reads are faster, 2600 megabytes per second because you know, the writes have to write the parity, but the reads don't have to read the parity. Um, after expansion, uh, writes get faster because we're writing less parity per uh, unit of data. Reads um, get slower. And the reason for that is that um, even though we don't technically have to read the parity, um, it, uh, we do read the parity. The reason is that, uh, I should put another slide in there. The reason is that, um, so if you look at this example, previously the parity was all on one disk. So we could just read from these three disks and not that one disk and thus saving some um, you know, bandwidth and IOPS of that disk to be used for other concurrent reads that are happening at the same time. Um, after the expansion, the parity now is kind of going diagonally across the disks. So you see the ones that have the P on them are going diagonally across the disks. So uh, one um, one logical block would typically encompass many um, rows of parity, uh, you know, parity rows. So like this this whole thing might be one logical block, um, and so you have to read all of this. Uh, there isn't like one disk that we can just ignore and not read from. You're gonna have to hit all the disks, and so um, in order to avoid, in order to get good like aggregation, we just read the parity anyways because it performs better that way. Uh, but still not as good as Skippy yet. Let me go back here. All right, cool. So that's why um, uh, after the expansion, the reads get a little bit slower. I um, mean, this this is this is kind of a worst case example. Um, we're using a shift nine, five twelve byte sector sizes, and we're going from three to four wide raid Z one um, with uh, larger uh, with wider raid Z um, initial raid Zs. Um, the differences here would be less. Both, you know, the, the difference between the read and write would be less, and the like improvement of write and um, decrease in read performance post expansion. All that stuff would be the effects would be less. Um, didn't quite mention this expansion performance yet. Uh, so I talked about how, like, you know, theory, right, expand, when we're doing the expansion, we're we're reading the, everything is going sequentially. Um, it should be really nice for spinning disks or any kind of disks. Um, but in, in practice, the expansion goes really slowly. And uh, the reason for that is that we're, um, we're issuing the ZIOs uh, one sector at a time, so five 12 bytes at a time in this example. Um, and that just has huge CPU costs. Those, those, those ZIOs are all kind of contiguous, so they can be aggregated by the VWQ layer, but the CPU costs of doing that are, are very substantial. Um, this will be less, like if you're using Eight, uh, 4K sector drives, then it'll go 8x faster because um, you just have that many less ZIOs to be processing. Um, so this is an area of uh, future work. Um, and uh, e but even with how it is, um, you know, six terabytes, six hours per terabyte, it's like, yeah, you kick it off, you come back the next day or over the weekend and it's done. It's usable. All right. So, um, where are we at? 
Uh, this is all implemented. Um, we've added tests to uh, the ZTest and the ZFS test suite. Um, I, I opened the final real uh, pull request yesterday. Um, so it's ready for code review. There's still a few things that um, I need to do, uh, some code cleanup, um, investing a few last uh, test failures. There's a bunch of um, future work that, uh, that um, I may or may not have time to do, but uh, we would love other folks help on as well. Um, the performance of the reflow, um, there's, uh, you know, it's very straightforward how we would improve that by issuing, um, you know, just issuing, uh, basically doing the aggregation in the uh, RAID-Z layer, which is what we're doing for reads that happen post, uh, post expansion. Um, so that you don't, so that you aren't dealing with all these millions of, uh, of little ZIOs. Um, other ideas like um, adding multiple drives at a time, um, like maybe you have a six wide and you want to add two drives. You can do that today by adding one and then adding the second one. Um, but there you're like copying all the data twice. Uh, it would be nice if you could just say, I want to add both of these and have it copy all the data just once. Um, it would also be nice to rewrite the existing data with the new data to parity ratio, saving you some space. Um, I worked I worked with the D-rate authors, um, Mark and Brian, uh, on kind of how we would do a similar style of expansion with D-rate. Um, and I think that that would work uh, pretty well, um, not implemented yet. Uh, and uh, lastly, for kind of extra, extra safety, maybe having an option to kick off scrubs uh, before and or after the, um, the expansion completes. Um, I've got, uh, so uh, this is the quadrennial report. I've been working on this for about four years. Uh, we've got a lot of questions about what this does and doesn't do over the years. Um, there's a lot of things that are kind of related to moving space around um, that is not, uh, that this design doesn't, um, uh, you know, implement. So like um, adding additional parity or removing disks or defragmenting, as we saw, it's like, we're moving everything into like the calculated new places. We aren't uh, moving things, uh, moving things around logically. Um, so I'd like to give a big thank you to the FreeBSD Foundation for sponsoring this work and um, for sticking with me for uh, the past four years. For, uh, the, the original uh, time estimate for how long it would take me to find all the time to do, to do this was not four years. Um, and uh, thanks to my employer, Delphix, for um, allowing me to do this. Um, and a couple of other contributors who have done uh, significant work on this, uh, Fedor from VStack and, and Stuart, uh, whose work was also sponsored by the foundation. Um, I'll take questions in just a sec. Um, if you like what you learned about ZFS, uh, you can get involved. Um, it's free. FreeBSD's ZFS is uh, the shared code base with uh, Linux and FreeBSD uh, since FreeBSD 13. Um, we do our development on GitHub. Uh, so you can see this pull request and all the open pull requests there. Uh, we have monthly um, open ZFS meetings, so just Zoom calls. The next one's uh, June 22nd. And we have an annual conference, um, which is normally in person. It was uh, online last year. We're still trying to figure out what exactly we're doing this year, but it'll be um, in the in the fall. And you can find all the info and links to this stuff on our website, openzfs.org. Awesome. Uh, now, uh, hopefully I have a minute or two for questions. Yeah, you, you can take a couple of minutes. Okay, cool. Uh, first question, I think I answered, are new rates still allocated with the old data parity ratio? No, they're allocated with the new one. Um, does RAID-Z expansion break booting from a pool with un, on unformatted disk with the bootloader DD to the bootloader region? Uh, I was not aware of that use case. Um, breaks the systems booting from a pool. It, yeah, I, I was not aware of that use case. Uh, I, I assume by unformatted, you mean it doesn't have a GPT label, um, but it is part of a pool. Uh, I would, like to learn more about that, uh, Jan. Um, if you wouldn't mind getting in touch with me, um, either on the uh, OpenZFS PR or um, uh, or email me uh, mearens at uh, delphix.com or matt at delphix.com, um, then I'd like to figure out uh, how that use case works. Um, next question. 
Is it faster to recreate the pool if enough temp disks are available? Uh, a, because, uh, well, I mean, depends on what you, yeah, I assume what you're talking about is like, could I, should I just copy the data off of that RAID-Z onto a new pool, reconfigure the um, pool, you know, create, then destroy that original pool, recreate it with the wider, uh, with, you know, with a wider RAID-Z and then copy everything back? Uh, I mean, you can certainly do that, and like that works today. That's worked, you know, for the past decade. Um, is it faster? Uh, well, <laughs> because the um, exp expansion performance is so abysmal right now, yeah, it probably would be faster. I mean, assuming that you have all, uh, of course, you got to have all that hardware lying around. Um, it, but uh, it is not theoretically faster. So. Um, uh, if we address these, you know, performance, you know, we can do this kind of local optimization of um, how the expansion is processing the ZIOs, and then um, the expansion would be faster. But yeah, I mean, if you if you got all the hardware lying around, then just yeah, sure, do, do your expansion with like ZFS send -r to a new pool, and then ZFS send -r back to another new pool. Those are all the questions that I saw in the Q&A. Are there other ones? There was one question on IRC that I think you may have answered, but I'll ask you anyway, which was, does not in the current work, but does this pave the way perhaps for allowing, I think they asked RAID Z2 to RAID Z3 conversions in the future? No, it does not. Okay, yeah. So uh, yeah, it, as you kind of saw, hopefully um, the, like how it works, should should make it clear why that is. You know, we're not actually looking at. Um, we don't know where the parity is. We don't care where the parity is um, as part of the expansion. So we aren't like changing the. We aren't changing the data. We're just, or the parity. We're just moving it around. Uh, there's a question about does the if the original bootloader region um, doesn't produce a desirable separation, do you use it again until it does? Um, we don't have to do that because it's so big. Um, the math works out that um, if you're using RAID Z, if you, sorry, if you're using um, 4K sectors or smaller, then uh, the boot region is large enough for RAID Zs that are like 700 wide or less. Um, and uh, you can only have a uh, rate. You only have it up to two fifty five wide. Um, that's the maximum possible. So uh, with RAID Z, like you know, ever. Um, so uh, I think that means that you know you can have uh, your sector size can be up to like thirty two k, and the bootloader region will be large enough. Um, if uh, if that if someday you're like, oh, actually my sector size is like. 128k or something, then yeah, you might. Then um, we might have to implement kind of what you're implying there, um, Jeremy, which is to uh, do this like um, shuffling through the bootloader region multiple times. Um, but that's not implemented today because it's 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 not it's definitely not needed. And in fact, because the, the bootloader region is so much bigger, um, it it means that you know once you've done that, then you're never at this like one sector at a time separation because uh, which is nice because that's the amount of separation there tells you like once you reach the end of it you have to do a txg sync to persist that so that like you know if you crash then you know where the progress is so you know where to read um, any blocks from old versus new locations okay well, I don't see any other questions. I do, someone on IRC did say that, I guess the use case where FreeBSD uses the boot area is for booting ZFS with an MBR instead of GPT. So I don't know. Most people are using GPT. You could always say, maybe you just can't expand those pools or something, but. Yeah, but I would love to be able to detect that. Um, you know, like it, it, it would not be great to just splat over it in that use case. Um, yeah. I'd rather I'd rather detect it and be able to say like oh no you can't you can't do expansion because x y and z you know switch to GPT partitions or whatever right um, so yep. so I'd love to figure out like how how do we detect that yep, thanks definitely.
Okay. Uh, so thanks, Matt. We're going to take about a five minute break and then we come back. Let me see, let me double check that schedule. Our next talk is actually going to be Mark Johnston talking about development workflows um, that he uses when working on previous D stuff. So thanks again, Matt, and we'll take about a five minute break. See you all in a bit. <laughs>